Can you hear me now? There we go. Awesome. Thank you, band. Uh, we're going to be singing a lot about the way um, and all that the next couple weeks because for the next three weeks, we're going to be talking through a series on the gospel of Jesus called This is the Way. And it's kind of based on a TV show called The Mandalorian. And it's from Disney Plus, so I apologize if you don't have Disney Plus. But it's based in the Star Wars universe. Star Wars has, I think, 11 movies now and TV shows. It's a billion dollar business. Came out in 1977, the first ever one. You do not need to know about Star Wars in order to understand what we're going to be talking about because we're really going to be talking about Jesus. But one of the reasons why we brought this up is last year when I saw season one of The Mandalorian, these people kept saying the phrase, and I knew exactly um, what that was, okay? Because when you watch Star Wars, you kind of know some eoth, if you will, or eoth, uh, some ways of communicating. There are certain phrases like Yoda. Everyone who watched Star Wars knows who Yoda is, but does anyone know Yoda's species? Does anyone know it? It's unknown, yeah, but we know what Yoda is. So when we saw the child, we think, oh, that's baby Yoda, even though it's not Yoda itself. It's just the same species. So there's some connections there. I want to talk a little bit about the Mandalorians. Now, the Mandalorians are these warriors, bounty hunters. They are powerful. They're very destructive. They even fight amongst themselves. But they're not like a, a race of people. They are a group kind of uh, with two big uh, characteristics. One, they pride themselves on honor, doing the honorable thing, even though bounty hunter, killing people and all that isn't necessarily honor in that. But to them it is. And then also they're creed people. And what that basically means is they live by a certain code. One of the codes is you never remove your helmet in front of other people. Of course, you do it for showers and all that, but never in front of other people. That's a code. So there's this phrase when I was watching season one that says, this is the way. Everyone say, this is the way. This is the way. That's what they say over and over and over again is this is the way. And I knew it the moment I saw season one, what I actually want to talk about because the first time I heard this is the way, I asked this question. I asked myself this question, what is the way of Jesus? So if the Mandalorians, whenever they say this phrase, it's kind of like, oh, I get you. I see what you're trying to tell me. And there's this almost secret code. They never actually go through the code <laughs> uh, list by list, but everyone just assumes this is the way. And as the audience member, or you're watching this, you're kind of like confusing, like, okay, what does he mean? Or what does she mean? So I wanted to ask you all, and we'll spend the next three weeks talking about what is the way of Jesus? Because Jesus did things differently. Jesus was here about 2,000 years ago, and he lived on this earth for about 33 years, died on the cross, rose again from death, and the whole world, the entire world, pivoted when that happened. It, it was a, a world-changing event. Some people didn't even notice it was a world-changing event until years later, but none of us would be in this room tonight if it wasn't for what Jesus did. So, Jesus brought about a new way of doing things. A new way of loving other people, a new way of prioritizing, a new way of communicating, a new way of dealing with conflict. He just brought things differently, and he brought a new way. Did you know, if you read the book of Acts, which is kind of the history of the first church, there was no such thing as called Christians. Christians, which mean follower of Jesus now, little, little Christ is technically what it's called, but Christians means follower of Jesus. That's a common term, especially in America now. But back when the first church and the first followers of Jesus was uh, and kind of living, they didn't call themselves Christians. Other people didn't call themselves Christians. They called themselves the way. They were followers of the way because Jesus brought such a new way of living. It was simply not a way, but the way. So whenever you read the book of Acts or looking at first church history, they weren't ever going to church. They were simply followers of the way. And so I want to talk about what is different for the way they lived compared to what Christians live nowadays. So um, what you need to know is the very first Christians, uh, followers of Jesus, and for the next 100 to 200 years, followers of the way, what we now call Christians, were persecuted and they, Christians, would be thrown into the gladiator events 
and be eaten by lions as a pre-show to the gladiator games. It's actually in Roman history that if you're a Christian, if you're followers of the way, you'd be persecuted, you get captured, you get thrown in, and you're eaten by lions as a warm-up show to the gladiator games. I've seen the movie Gladiator. That's not in that movie, all right? But it's, it's really interesting if you're like, why would anyone sign up to be part of the way if you knew this was the result? There has to be something so special and so unique and so powerful of being a follower of Jesus that you could even put your life at risk. Because the Christian church, the, the people of the way, like it grew like wildfire during this time. It started growing all over the world, even though it was illegal in most of the Roman known world. So what is the way of Jesus? What is the way of Jesus? We need to look at that. Um, and it's in John chapter 13. And if you have a Bible app, you can highlight this or whatever, because we're going to really park on these sets of verses for the next three weeks. John is one of uh, Jesus' disciples. He was actually the youngest disciple. Some people think he was only the age of 14 when he became one of Jesus' disciples. He is nicknamed the disciple that Jesus loved, which means Jesus had a special, unique relationship with John compared to the other disciples on that. And here's what he writes. This is Jesus talking to his disciples, the 12 disciples who he spent three years training before he left, right, to kind of pass on the way. And here's what he says. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love... For one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. That is like, oh yeah, no big deal, right? We look at that now, it's like, okay, this, that makes sense. If you really look into that, it's not how many Bible verses you memorize. It's not how many times you go to Axis and you keep up your streaks. It's not if you come from a good Christian family. It's not based on the number of times you give to the church. What proves and what shows the world that you are a follower of the way of Jesus is your love for one another, your love of your enemies, your love of your neighbors, your love of your siblings, which is harder sometimes than loving your neighbors, um, your love of other people, including other believers of the way. That is a powerful statement, and that set up a new way of thinking and a new way of doing things. What Jesus brought about is a church, a church term called covenants, okay? So basically what this means is a covenant is like a contract, under the old covenants, okay, what we would describe now as testament, there's two books in the Bible, Old Testament, or two sections of the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. Testament is another word for covenant, as in contract, as in we are going to basically sign on the dotted line that God and his people, uh, all of his creation, is going to have a relationship, and that's a contract. We're going to lock in on this. Now, here's the thing. Jesus brought something new. So we need to talk a little bit about Old Covenant versus New Covenant. And I know this gets in a little more abstract, but we need to kind of talk about this because it explains what we're going to be talking about later on. The Old Covenant is basically the first five books of the Old Testament or the Bible, all right? It is the law of Moses. It is 600, I think 613 laws that you need to follow perfectly in order for it to be saved, and if you don't follow it perfectly, then you need to take an animal, you need to put your sins by placing your hands on this animal, that animal dies in your stead, and then you do this whole process over again and try to follow the 613 laws. You mess up again, you need another animal sacrifice, and so forth and so forth. The new covenant, what Jesus specifically brought was this. He says, no, we're not going to have 613 rules. Here's what you need to know. Love God, love others. That's it. Love God, love others. Everything falls underneath these two things. Simple, simple by, uh, by concept, very difficult to live out. So Jesus was teaching this, and it was so radical and so different. Now we think it's no big deal. Love is kind of the in thing <laughs> the past 20 years particularly. Um, we're supposed to love each other and be nice and kind and not say anything mean or all this stuff, right? That's no big deal. But back then... What Jesus was saying is, look, it's no longer the old way and how you've been living your life, if you were in church back then, the Old Testament ways or Jesus' ways, how you've been living your life is done. It's over. You need to live this new way. That is so radical, people killed Jesus for it. Here's why. The old way, 
the Old Testament, the ways before Jesus was all about if you do this, then this will happen, both good and bad. All right? If you listen, then God will bless you. If you look, then God will bless you. Or if you bring, if you follow, if you pay attention, if you make this, if you obey, or if you disobey, then God will punish you. The new way, the new way is this. It is done. So uh, here's what that means. Because Jesus did it all, there's nothing for you to do. And everyone's like, okay, that's no big deal. Uh, Let me unpack this because we have a hard time, and I do too, have a hard time living this out. If it is done, all right, that means you are forgiven because what Jesus did. You are healed because what Jesus did. You are blessed because of what Jesus did. You are righteous or made righteous because of what Jesus did. You are holy. You are mighty because of what Jesus did. You are accepted and you are loved because of what Jesus did. Not because of anything you did or us did or any one of us. We didn't do anything and we can't do anything to improve our status with God or to hurt our status with God. But we don't always live that way. Another way of thinking about it is the Old Testament, all right, the Old Covenant way before Jesus came was it's all about you and what you do. And because you did this, God is required to bless you or God is required to punish you. And it's all based on works. It's all based on earning. But the new way, the new covenant that Jesus was bringing about, and he, he took three years to fulfill all of it and to teach on it, is says God has already provided everything. It is done so you don't have to do anything else. Now, simple concept, much harder to live out. So if you really think about it, you need to ask yourself, does that mean we don't have to follow any of the Old Testament commandments? Is the Old Testament useless? What about the Ten Commandments? The Old Testament, now I'm not trying to be controversial, and I want to be perfectly clear, and I can talk about this more after if you have any questions, but the Old Testament laws are done, completed. We don't have to live by the Old Testament laws, including the Ten Commandments, again. (gasps) No, I'm just kidding. Here's what that means. Because we don't have to live by the Old Testament commandments, including the Ten Commandments, we just simply have to follow the two commandments, love God, love others, some things still apply. As in, can you murder someone and not love them, all right? Or, and love them. No. So it follows. Can you envy or can you covet or can you wish for something else? Or can you uh, think about hate and wanting to kill that person or steal their wife or husband? No. All that still applies under love God, love others. But in the Old Testament, you know it says you can't eat shellfish? I love crab. Right? I have sinned because I've eaten crab if you live under the old way. For people who, who talk about sin and talk about what's wrong and they use Old Testament verses, they're actually taking Scripture out of context. Here's a great example. Some of you, I, I'm dealing with graduation every year, and a lot of times people put this verse, 29, Jeremiah 29, 11, on a graduation verse. Does anyone know what it says? It says, for I, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to forsake you. This, those kind of verses. It is not talking about anyone in America in the 21st century. It's talking about a Jewish person or a people group of Jews 4,000 years ago and trying to put the, the Old Testament into modern day application doesn't really work. Now, does that mean we ignore the Old Testament? Absolutely not. It's a historical document. It also has great character studies on moral development, and we have a lot to pull out of it, but we shouldn't live by the Old Testament ways because Jesus brought something new. Here's here's what that means, okay? Because Jesus brought something new, he didn't wipe away the Old Testament like, oh, that doesn't exist anymore, and you can do whatever you want because we don't have to live by the Ten Commandments. No, he simplified it, and he accomplished the Old Testament. He wasn't replacing the Old Testament. He says, the Old Testament is done and finished. Here's what that means. Matthew 5, 17, um, Matthew, another disciple of Jesus, kind of goes through this, and this is Jesus talking, and he says, "Don't don't misunderstand me why I, Jesus, have come. I did not come to abolish the law or the writings of the prophets. Basically, what we now call the Old Testament, it wasn't called the Old Testament back then, 
No, I have come to accomplish their purpose. So it's a, a, a little interesting. The purpose of the Old Testament or the law is to show that we need a Savior. It's to show that we need Jesus because we can't earn enough on our own. Um, okay, let's, let's do an illustration here. How many of you, uh, I need a volunteer. First off, Drew, why don't you come on up here? Uh, but I need a volunteer who can, who can shoot a bow and arrow. All right, come on up. I, I have seen you shoot a bow and arrow. Uh, Drew, go ahead. Guess what? You get to shoot Drew. <laughs> All right, Drew, come over here. And why don't you come over here? Go ahead and share, share your name to everyone. Uh, Jared. Just Jared, everyone. I've seen Jared shoot. He's pretty powerful on this. Um, so, Drew, yeah, there you go. <laughs> here, take the tablet, too. <laughs> So he's going to hold up a target. Yeah, there you go. Hold up higher. <laughs> All right. And I just want you to shoot the target. That's it. That's simple. Okay. Good job. Good job. Okay. He made it. How far apart is this? Ten feet? Right? Okay, Drew, go back there a little bit. We're going to do this again. So stand right here. Come right here. Thank you. All right. Now, for those of you who are watching online, this is about, what, 40 feet? Okay, 40 feet. Now, going back up a little bit further, Drew, there you go. Okay, now I want you to hit the bullseye, which is the yellow part. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. Hey, not bad. Not bad. All right, Drew, go all the way to the door. Now... He hit the target. He did. He hit the target, but it wasn't the bullseye. I want you to hit the bullseye, and it only counts if you hit the bullseye. Here we go. This is about 100 feet. Ah, shorts. Now, Jared, if I give you another arrow, do you think you can even do it? Why not? He says it's too far. All right, let's give Jared and Drew a hand. Good job. You can have a seat. So... This is a simple, simple illustration, and here's what that means. The definition of sin, all right, is not a mistake. It's not doing something wrong. It's actually an archery term. It means to miss the mark. Jared's mark was the yellow bullseye. Even though he hit the target, thank you, even though he hit the target, he still missed the bullseye. When it's talking about sin and what separates us from God, because God is perfect and he doesn't allow anyone into heaven who's not perfect, we have a problem because it's like we're shooting a bow and arrow from someone in Colorado who's holding a target. It's impossible to hit the target, let alone hit the bullseye. And what this means, all right, is sin is separating us and we cannot do anything, no matter how hard we work, no matter how many times we try to make it into heaven, because that's not how this works. God didn't design it to where we can earn our own salvation. He designed it to where the gospel is, where God has taken care of it, and Jesus becomes the archer, the bow, the arrow, and even the target, and it hits perfectly every time. And because of what Jesus did on the cross by taking the sin, our sin, instead of us, we are made right and can be in heaven. And that's not fair. Because Jesus took all the punishment. Jesus did all the work. And yet we get all the glory and all the benefits. That's how much that Jesus was talking about when he says love. So the gospel, it's really cool. We hear the gospel and we hear good news, right? Do you know the gospel is, comes from another Greek word? This is a special Greek word. Anyone can say it out loud? What? Euangelion. I have a hard time saying it. It's Greek. Here's what that means. It means the gospel or good news. So whenever you hear the gospel or read the gospel in your, in your English translation of your Bible, it's usually this word. This is a really cool word. I just found this out just a, a few moments ago, like not literally moments ago, probably about a year ago. Here's what this means, okay? It means this, all right, that it is the runner who runs to the king and tells the king 
that there's victory on the battlefield. And then the king celebrates, everyone's excited and all that. So it is the runner who tells someone, the king, that there's victory. Did the king do anything on the battlefield? No. Jesus did all the hard work and he claimed the victory. He did all the work over here. And the gospel is us telling other people or telling our friends, our neighbors, our family that Jesus won and we are here to celebrate. It is nothing that the runner or the king has done. Now, if the law or the Old Testament or the Old Covenant is about obedience and do, 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 the New Testament is about done or being the gospel. And we're going to unpack this the next three weeks. It's about having a relationship with Jesus. Here's the thing, and I'm not trying to judge anyone, and I'm not saying you're a bad person if you have a cross necklace or anything like that, but too many times Christians celebrate the cross, which is only an instrument of death, and they forget about what really happened with Jesus, who got off the cross and, and literally defeated death. Too many times we focus on the death part when anyone could die for their friends, but only one person came back from life, which is Jesus Christ. And that changes everything. So here's the danger, and here's what we're going to finish up with today. The danger is when we start having old covenant thinking and new covenant thinking. And we don't even realize this, okay? Here's what this means, okay? It means we kind of do a buffet-style faith. I'm up here, a buffet, okay? Now, if you've ever gone to a buffet, I love buffets, so COVID has really hit me hard. Um, But I love buffets, and buffets are great because you can pick and choose what you want, okay? You can get chips. You don't have to get apples, all right? Maybe some bread, uh, pomegranate. I don't want that. Uh, All right? You don't have to get any fruit. You can load up on candy, all right, if you wanted to. Because the best part is anyone at a buffet, there's a no judgment zone because everyone's already at the buffet, so they're not going to judge another person eating whatever they want. So you don't have to get greens or anything like that. We do that with our Christian faith all the time. We pick and choose what we want to believe, and we pick and choose what we want to follow and accept. Ah, someone says that is sin. I don't want to believe that is sin. So I'm not going to agree or live that out the thinking that's sin, and I'm going to continue doing it. Ah, We also believe in, oh, you know what? This is really fun. I'm going to believe this part, that this is going to make me saved, or this is going to make me better for God because it's really easy to do. I'm a quiet person. I'm I'm more of a a quiet person, so I'm just going to read my Bible every day for an hour, and that's going to be better. There's nothing wrong with reading your Bible every day, but if you put it above a relationship with Jesus, you're missing the point. So here's six things that I have kind of seen, whether myself or other people, of mixing old covenant and new covenant kind of belief. Uh, if you have fear that God is going to hold your sins against you when you die, you're under the old law, not the new law. When it's done, it's done. All right, say that with me. When it's done, it's done. Right? Go. That means you can't have any fear or you don't need to have any fear because all that has been wiped away for what Jesus did. But for some reason, we have this fear like, oh, I did this really bad thing, and God's going to hold that against me. Or, for some reason, this is a political thing. I don't know why, if they really think about it. We need the Old Testament. We need the Ten Commandments in our courthouses, in our schools, and everything else. But we don't say anything about the Sermon on the Mount, which is literally Jesus' best message on explaining what does it mean to love God, love others. But we think, think about this Old Covenant Ten Commandments. Number three. Christian parents kicking out their son or daughter for being pregnant or gay or any other sin that they would say, oh, you don't deserve recognition or you don't deserve reconciliation or you don't deserve love. I'm going to kick you out. Jesus, I don't know would ever do that. Number four, Christian leaders declaring a natural disaster of God's judgment. Oh, there was a lot of sin in Vegas or a lot of sin in New Orleans and a hurricane happened. Yep, that's God punishing them. That's old covenant thinking, because that's not the new covenant way of thinking. Or making deals with God in order to get what we want. We've never done this, right? Never. God, if you just give me a B on this test, I promise I'll go to Axis the next four weeks. I won't even mess up. God, right? Never has happened, right? 
I've done that multiple times in that. Um, or, or the opposite, God, I have been tithing every week. I deserve a co- convertible or I deserve this. And we do really good things because we really want to earn our favor. And there are certain denominations in the Christian faith who even say, all you have to do if you mess up and sin is just say a couple Hail Marys and then you're wiped clean. And it's work-based and it's all about what you can do. But if you read scripture and if you read and you study Jesus, none of that falls under it. That's mixing and matching. That's a buffet-style faith. That is not, this is the way. So what is the way of Jesus? It's very easy to hear. It's very easy to have a concept to understand. Love God, love others. Very difficult to live it out. But you could say it's L. You know how to spell. O V. <laughs> love. The type of love that is unconditional, the type of love that has no strings attached, the type of love that is all inspiring, encouraging, and wants to grow more and more and more. So, here's what we're going to wrap up with, okay? I want us to kind of picture what the disciples were doing when Jesus gave this commandment. Clear the back of uh, the beginning of the message I talked about, John 13. So now I'm giving a new commandment, Jesus says, love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Picture Jesus talking to the 12 disciples, and he just spent the past three years hammering this concept in over and over and over again, and they still are a little uneasy in what he's talking about. When we hear, love as I have loved you, We're on the other side of the cross. We know 2,000 years later that Jesus died on the cross for them. And that is the type of love he is talking about. But when Jesus told the disciples this, they had no idea he was going to die. They had no idea he was going to be betrayed. They had no idea he was going to go on the cross. So think about this. When, When the disciples heard that Jesus says, love as I have loved you, They personalized it on how Jesus loved them and interacted with them the past three years. Matthew probably thought, Jesus, I'm a tax collector. I betray my own people by taking money from the Jews and giving it to an oppressive Roman government, and everyone hated me. But Jesus, you didn't hate me, and you loved me and accepted me. John, who was a little kid, 14-year-old, and most scholars would say, Everyone will reject him. He's too young. He can't do anything. And here John is part of a very crucial group. And John would say, Jesus accepted me, even though I was, everyone else thinks I was too young. Or Nathaniel, when Nathaniel first heard that Jesus was from Nazareth, do you know what he says in Scripture? He says, nothing good comes from Nazareth. That's an insult. He insulted Jesus, the first thing he said about Jesus. And here Nathaniel thinking, you know what? Jesus still loved me and accepted me, even though I insulted him first. And he never judged me, and he never chastised me. This is the type of love that the disciples were thinking about in this whole process. So I'm going to invite the band on up as we end here, because I have one last concept that I wanted you to kind of think about. So I want you to close your eyes right now really quick. Just close your eyes. And I want you to picture what we call the Last Supper. This is the last night where Jesus is in the upper room with his 12 disciples. And literally that night after the supper, he gets betrayed and put on the cross. And within days, he's dead. The disciples do not know this is his last supper or this is their last supper together. They do not know that the entire world is going to change in the matter of 48 hours. They're just having another meal with Jesus. And Jesus then challenges them one more time. Love as I have loved you. So picture that. Picture that situation where the intimate, friendly, loving meal, and you don't even know this is your last. I saw a hashtag. You can open your eyes or keep them closed. It's up to you. I saw a hashtag um, the other day, and I thought it was fascinating. Have you seen this hashtag on social media? Judas82. 
People are putting tattoos on their arms um, for this hashtag. And I was like, what is this hashtag all about? And I, and I was like, okay, I got to look this up. So I typed in Judas82, and it was my whole social media feed was full of heartbreaking and inspiring and encouraging stories. Because here's what that means. Jesus was all-knowing, and he knew that Judas would betray him. He knew that Judas is literally working, and it wasn't overnight. It was weeks, maybe even months of working with the, the Jewish leaders and all that and giving up Jesus and his life for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus knew all of this was happening. The disciples didn't, but Jesus did. And yet, Jesus still fed Judas because that's the type of love that Jesus had. Jesus knew that Judas would betray him, and yet Jesus still prayed for the person who was going to betray him. That's the type of love that Jesus is talking about. Jesus washed his betrayer's feet and humbled himself to the lowest of low, even lower than his own betrayer. So when you hear or see the hashtag Judas82, this is a perfect example of the type of love, the type of love that Jesus is trying to say and trying to live out and trying to encourage. Because here's the thing, we are all Judas. We are. I'm gonna have the adult leaders come on and line up right here. And we're gonna end with a time of prayer if you wanna pray. But here's what this means. We're going we're gonna to have a time of singing and, and all that, but we want a time to pray. And if you want to come up and pray, you can come up to me, you can come up to any one of these adult leaders. Because here's where I want to unpack this. We are all Judas too. That means we all betrayed God. We all spat on God. We all kick God to the curb. Now, we don't think we feel that. We, we justify our sin. We justify us looking on our phones, definitely things that images we shouldn't be looking at, or we post on social media all the gossip and terrible, vile things that we don't like of another person, or we hate this teacher, or we hate whatever, and we pass it on. It doesn't matter what that sin is. We've all our Judases and betrayed Jesus, and yet... Jesus still says, no, it's still done for you. I have a gift. I have salvation here for you. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to be, make sure you're good enough for it. All you have to do is just take it. No strings attached. So here's the thing. If you have never taken it, if you've never accepted Jesus as a friend, as a savior, as a relationship, I want you to come up when the music starts and pray with one of the adult leaders. Maybe you have accepted Christ though, but you've kind of gone off the path. You've kind of done things that you haven't been proud of and you've just kind of been coasting through faith. And you definitely haven't done the type of love that Jesus was talking about when he says, love as I have loved, a sacrificial love. And maybe you want to be prayed for because you want to throw that weight off that's been holding you back. Or maybe you have someone in mind that God has put in your life that you've been too afraid to tell them and show them love. And so you've been hesitant because you don't want to be rejected or you don't want to insult them or you're just downright afraid. This is a time to pray. This is a time to start over. Axis, which is what we're here on Sunday nights, means turning point. So go ahead and stand up. And at any time, and if you want to come up and pray, go and pray. But right now, go ahead and stand up. You can sing. You can have your eyes closed. You can go with a friend. You can go alone. This is no judgment zone. We want you to be prayed for. If you don't even know what to pray for, these adult leaders will pray for you. Don't sit there or stand there because of nervousness. Come up and pray.
Father, you are the way, you are the truth, you are the life. No words can be more powerful. Help us to live that out. I pray for the people here today and the people watching online, the people who couldn't make it here tonight. I pray now that you continue to fill their life with glory and not their own glory, but your glory. Help us to live by the new covenant, by the new way of love God, love others, Lord. And not, help us not to live in fear or regret or shame or guilt because you have done it all. Help us to live out the gospel in every aspect of our life. And all God's people said, amen. Go ahead and head to your small groups.